Hello, everyone, and welcome to the, this most recent iteration of the uh, Southampton Institute of Arts and Humanities Public Life Conversation Series. We're very happy today to be joined by Laura Mulvey and Victor Bergen. Uh, Laura is professor of film at Birkbeck College, University of London. She's author of many books uh, that you all probably know, Visual and Other Pleasures, Fetishism and Curiosity, uh, her excellent book on Citizen Kane, uh, Death 24 Times a Second, etc., etc., quite a few. And uh, she has made six, six films in collaboration with Peter Woolen, including Riddles of the Sphinx and uh, Frida Kahlo and Tina Modotti. Victor Bergen is here as a guest and as a host, because he is, of course, my colleague at Winchester School of Art, where he is professor of visual culture at uh, WSA. But he is also professor emeritus of history and consciousness at University of California, Santa Cruz, emeritus Miller Chair of Fine Art at Goldsmith uh, College at University of London. He is, a, of course, an artist and a writer, and his books include The Camera, Essence and Apparatus, uh, the, the very well-known and off-sided The Remembered Film, In Different Spaces, uh, Place and Memory and Visual Culture, The End of Art Theory, and Thinking Photography. His still and moving image work is represented in collections that include the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Tate Modern London, and the Pompidou in Paris. So welcome to you both, Laura and Victor. The Hi. format for today will be, uh, I'm gonna have some prompts for them and uh, some questions, and then we will have a conversation, primarily Victor and Laura will have a conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we will um, move to Q&A. So if you have questions, place them in the chat and uh, we'll get to a few of them. I'm afraid there won't be that much time at the end, but we'll do what we can. So, okay, to get us started, uh, you, were both, you were both born in 1941. You were both teenage Francophiles who helped contribute to the utopian politics of the 1970s and 1980s and up to the present by sharing the influences of semiotics psychoanalysis and feminism, and thus informing debates about art and ideology. Could you both get the conversation going by privileging certain moments of encounter with these texts, ideas, works, anything you know that was perhaps a particular catalyst or crystallization for your engagements? Well, I really wanted to go back a little bit and ask Victor I was very struck by the way that Victor describes himself as dreaming about, as a teenager in Sheffield, as about dreaming about being elsewhere. Does that ring a bell, Victor? Yes, yeah. Well, I was you know, product of the Northern Industrial Working Class and the Sheffield was, it was quite grim, so I had fantasies of uh, France and America. America represented modernity. It was uh, skyscrapers and freeways and, of course, Hollywood cinema. Because yeah. Mother took me to the cinema when I was a kid regularly. And France represented poetry, the intellect. So it, it was, you know, and, and then I wound up living in America, teaching in an American university, married to a French woman. So. Be careful what you want when you're young. You may get it when you get older. <laughs> but I was also interested in the way that this uh, this dreaming of France and the United States also prefigured our our later intellectual influences. Mm. Because you describe very clearly in uh, one of your texts the way you kind of dived almost literally into Bart yes. with a French dictionary. So yeah. there was a way in which this uh, love, it, this love of, uh, this Francophilia, uh, love of French cinema in my case, fascination with French fashion, with Paris, everything French, then, as it were, emerged on a completely different level with the emergence of Bart and uh, um, Althusser and so on. And then you could also say that the United States emerged uh, through Hollywood cinema, popular culture, and so on. 
and the way that these two things were prefigured by our teenage dreams. Did, uh, when I dreamed of living in America, I wonder if you ever did, Laura, because I've never thought of you as suddenly oriented towards American cinema, to the American imaginary. But I don't recall you ever having ex told of a burning desire to actually live there as, as I did. No, I don't think I did. In fact, to, to, to bear this out very literally, um, when uh, Peter first said to me in 1968, I found a cheap fare to New York, do you want to go? I said, I know everything about New York that I need to know from the movies. Why do I have to literally go there? Yes. And then, of course, when I did get there, I found it was a totally different world of extraordinary excitement and exhilaration. Mm. But I just felt it was odd that these two worlds the, uh, um, were that, uh, and I, I loved America through the cinema. But then I also think, and I wondered what you thought about this too, that it also represents a way in which our generation turned against our own culture. Mm. Well, I was going to argue that. Yes, yes. Why do you think that was, if that's the case? I, I, I know in my own case, it was um, it was a desire to escape the uh, class structure of Britain, which is it's not that it doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. To escape, you know, my own version of it, as it were. Um, I think that that was the primary uh, that was the primary desire, just to get out from under that sense of. Uh, not being part of anything, really, or yeah. not not having the right of access uh, to anything. I mean, I I, um, I I got a grammar school education, so I'm certainly um, you know, grateful to the Labour government for that. But I left after my O levels because the working class families I came from, in those families, it was expected that when you finish your schooling, you would go out to work and you would bring money into the house. So I, you know, I left school quite early, and it was only. I won't go into the whole story because it's not. This is not yet. This is your life. <laughs> Again, I, I think that's probably a reference that's lost on some of the younger. <laughs> but but, we get it. but I, but, but I, you know, I eventually found my way to um, art school, and mm -hmm. through art school into, uh, you know, the condition that the French call a transfuge de class. Uh, I'm reminded of um, a story about Mao Zedong meeting Khrushchev and they didn't get on, of course, we know that. And uh, Khrushchev at one point said to Mao Zedong, well, you know, the difference between us two is that you're a son of the bourgeoisie and I'm a son of the peasant class. And Mao Zedong said, yeah, but what we have in common is we both betrayed our class. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but I, I did come from um, um, intellectual uh, intellectual family in which women's education was valued and so on. So uh, uh, I came from a rather different social background. But I think that there was just a sense that Englishness was very parochial. I mean, this might be something that we've come back to through the B thing that you mentioned earlier. But there was a way in which our island and the way that it was visualized and imagined uh, was something quite uh, claustrophobic, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, yeah. Perhaps we should move on. Um, I think Victor said we shouldn't stray down memory lane too far. <laughs> Well, I think this the the straying down memory lane is part of the rationale of this. Um, and so I'd like to kind of steer you guys to uh, the 70s and the 80s, that moment where uh, Laura, you and Peter Woolen were making several very influential films that explored uh, experimental cinema and practice film and continental theory and how the intersection of the art film uh, operated with regard to uh, the burgeoning artistic practice and theory that was growing increasingly discontented perhaps with you know just the general change in the art world in the 60s and your work with peter uh, inspired victor 
who said that he had grown disenchanted with that art world and that you two became part of his aspirational and imaginary audience before you really? became actual interlocutors. That's really? right. Uh, of course. And I have told you that before, Laura. I so, have. I probably, probably kind of uh, um, uh, failed to take it quite in. I, I, I think, you know, possibly that was another imaginary world that I had aspirations mm. for joining. So there was America, there was France. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I came back from uh, graduate school in the States and I, I found myself my first job in the, in the 60s in, um, in Nottingham. And there's a guy there who had a background in anthropology and he introduced me to um, no, no, we, we, he introduced me to elements. We, we bonded over this translation of conversations with Claude Lévi-Strauss, with uh, Georges Chabagnier, uh, which was published in translation, this little blue Fontana book. And, um, and then and we kind of bonded over that. And then he said, well, you might enjoy reading this other book, Elements of Semiology, which had also been published in translation, <laughs> in, in Fontana, what we would have done without that. Yeah. And the, you know, it was a kind of Saul on the road to Damascus moment for me, you know, the scales dropped from my eyes. That was absolutely what I'm looking for. What, uh, you, know, you know, the aspiration, if you like, to a scientific criticism, all I didn't frame it that way at the time, that's kind of Althusserian version. But, but at least here was an alternative to the kind of um, impressionistic, subjective writing that was passing for art criticism, you know, the mm -hmm. theory of such. So uh, I looked for other books by Bart and uh, only found Writing Degree Zero in translation. So that's when I decided I took myself off to Paris and came back with a book load of, uh, a bag load of books and bought a big English French dictionary. But then later, so when a film comes in, um, I heard, now, I don't remember how now, but somebody told me there was a reading group being established at the BFI it was being run by this guy called Ben Brewster, because the you know the translator of Arthur, so, um on linguistics. So I started reading elements. I thought great, and I got access to that reading group, and and we just read linguistics. We just read through the entire uh, pantheon. Of that. And and was Peter involved with that? Sorry. Was Peter involved with that group? No, he was not. There was, um, it was Ben Brewster who uh, dreamed the whole thing up and constructed the reading list and provided these um, Ronio style copies. And, um, but Colin McCabe contributed from time to time. He would come in from time to time to lead a group. And we were all expected to, you know, to, um, to present. And I was given the task of presenting um, uh, the work of Louis Hjemslev. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Apologies to the Danes out there. A Dane once told me, no, is this something like Hell's Leo or something, something like that. Anyway, and I gave the presentation and afterwards Colin McKay came up to me and said, that was very good. He said, have you thought about writing about cinema? And I said, <laughs> and I said I'm not interested in cinema. That's, that's not why I'm here. And he looked at me with this like, look at I can only describe it as disgust. <laughs> oh, amazing. It was, but yeah, that's, um, that's how I kind of, my orbit passed temporarily through that of the, of the BFI, which you and Peter, of course, were probably unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, yeah. connected with. Well, Peter introduced a, semi a semiotics and cinema reading group in the 1960s when he was working at the BFI uh, education department. And then that was when he started um, um, getting those discussions going that later led on to Screen, which was another world in which you and Peter definitely, and Colin McCabe, no doubt, uh, crossed uh, um, paths. But I just... Just to say the screen was monumentally important to me. I had a, a subscription, it dropped through the letterbox, <laughs> and I picked it up and I read it cover to cover. 
Yeah. So this, let's put the dates here. We're talking kind of uh, early-ish 70s, yes. right way through the decade. Yes, yeah. that's right. And what was important about Screen was uh, its introduction of Althusser and Althusser's ideas on ideology in cinema, which of course related to ideology, spectatorship more generally, but also an interest in what you might call the historic relationship between the radical aesthetic uh, and radical politics, yes. going back to the Soviet Union and the special issues on left, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Um, but I thought I should just sketch in, um, just to keep the balance going, uh, Peter's and my equivalent moments. I think possibly um, my equivalent of Victor's moment really came out of the extraordinary impact that the women's liberation movement had on me, uh, where I joined a reading group too. And uh, we started to read through the great male theorists who actually tried to analyze why women had fallen into exploitation and oppression. And we plowed through a lot of greats and then we came to Freud. And then we thought, Freud has blind spots. He's not necessarily perfect, but he's actually interested in the same kinds of issues about sexuality and how sexuality relates to fantasy, oppression, etc. But uh, what was really important for me in this context was uh, the way in which the women's liberation struggle mutated from uh, a struggle about the woman's body as a site of oppression and exploitation, whether to do with abortion rights, contraception rights, childcare, um, whatever it might be, uh, through the kind of crucial moment of this ad exploits women, the stickers in the underground, to realizing that Im images of the women's body were a site of oppression and exploitation. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a moment where Victor and I can kind of coincide, which was the realization that the politics of representation itself was one of the revolutionary things that hit us during this period. Absolutely. For me, it was that shift to uh, realizing that semiotics could allow one to say, okay, this image might have as its signified a woman, but sorry, its signifier is woman, but its signified is not woman, it's the fantasies of the patriarchal unconscious. Yes. So we separated out the, ref the signifier, the signified, and the referent. And that's where semiotics helped us, and also psychoanalysis by bringing in the concept of the patriarchal unconscious. And what, and what the feminism that you were contributing to uh, brought to me, uh, round about that time, I was a um, you know, self-defining left artist making overtly propagandistic work, posters for the street, and so on. And I'd e equated political art with art with a political content. And it was feminism that led me to see the difference between, as I put it at the time, the representation of politics and the politics of representation. So, 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 so the question became one of representation, one of language and, and so on. And, and that turning point again, I owe to feminism. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's sort of really nice. Uh, so Ryan, does that kind of come back to the kind of dialogues that you were looking for? Yes, it does. And I was, I was, I was, uh, I, I was just reminded too that um, my my supervisor said that uh, used to say that uh, postmodernism and poststructuralism was feminism done by men. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've Who carried that one forward. Can you tell us? Excuse me. Who is your supervisor? He he was Stephen Tyler, who's an anthropologist, cultural uh, anthropologist uh, at Rice University. Uh, yeah, he, he, he was wonderful. Had had appointments in five different departments. Um, I knew what he was talking about, too. did. <laughs> but I was also kind of wondering, when did 
Victor and his work kind of theoretical and artistic appear on your screen, Laura? Um, I think Victor appeared as a, uh, you know, as a person and a friend very uh, early on, but also, um, and, uh, and this is slightly awkward because one of the earliest, if not actually the very earliest piece I ever wrote about art, because uh, I only started writing in the, uh, it was only really the women's movement that, uh, that made it possible for me to write. And I think the very first piece I wrote was about Victor Bergen and Barbara Kruger. Mm. Um, and what's so embarrassing is because I keep moving around and I'm now in the country, I wanted to reread this before I saw Victor and had our conversation, but I haven't been able to find the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, so there is a very definite moment when Victor did appear, uh, and I was I was writing about um, that very beautiful early work, Victor. What was it called? Now Victor. I'm 80, I can't remember anything. The one you wrote about in that article. Yes. The Hotel La Tour. That's it, the Hotel yeah. La Tour. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did feel a real rapport uh, with his work, and particularly the way it related to the unconscious, to dream, to fantasy. Uh, uh, and, uh, and there was definitely a common theoretical link be between us. But also, I think it was the way in which the, and this might take us on perhaps to later, the way that uh, Victor's images always imply something more. Yes. Something beyond uh, and something which is not represented or even perhaps representable. Right. Uh, yeah. Something that evades the picture uh, and which demands inquiry, investigation, decipherment, etc. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of discursive ebb and flow of uh, art and cinema and cinematic theory that was seems to have been a bit more operative and apparent than it is in the present, although that might be an oversimplification. And That's so it's like a statement. It's, it's sort of a statement, uh, but I one that I hoped might evoke um, some commentary. Can you reform your statement as a question, Ryan? Okay. Um, in what way <laughs> <laughs> would my statement become a question? Now, in what way would um, would the at that moment in the seventies, sixties, seventies, when art and moving image and theory were beginning to be a bit more uh, discursively ebbing and flowing and mutually influential and inextricable to to a large extent? How did that begin to shape your work? Because obviously, Victor, you moved from doing primarily still image work to moving image work in various guises, you know, going from video to CGI later on. So, and, and, and with Laura, the, the film work that you were doing with Peter seems to have been deeply um, engaged with various artistic strands that were operative at that moment. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in that, that mutual influence, if that makes any sense. I'm just trying to think this through. I mean, um, it's something I, it, that I think in Victor's Mutations essay that I was reading, I think he points out there that when I wrote Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, it was not only a critique, it was also a plea for a new kind of cinema. Mm -hmm. So what I think we had in common with others, and I think this is where the concept of utopianism comes in so strongly to the moment, we actually felt we could invent new languages. Not that we thought that we were, put it like this, um, it, we, we didn't want to come out of the blue with a completely new way of thinking and representing. We wanted to turn representation and language into an area of inquiry and sure. open it up as it were, kind of as it were, kind of stretch it right out so that other things that were concealed could suddenly become visible and questionable. And I did write down a little um, thing from Peter Sainsbury who started the wonderful journal 
after image. Did you ever read after image, Victor? Of course, yes. yes. And I just noted that uh, Peter Zinsby's question was how to establish a cinema which does not portray, reflect, interpret, symbolize, but inquires. The new cinema is epistemological. Yeah. Wow, yes. That's, uh, that's, that's, that, sounds, that was great, yeah. yeah. So I think there's something there in that we were shifting into a mode of inquiry and, uh, the and using theory as an instrument there. What do you think, Victor? What I'm thinking of by association is that you're referring to this, what you characterize as a utopian moment. I mean, certainly at that time, I remember that um, I was hoping that semiotics, well, in, in fact, the sister journal of screen, um, film education, wasn't it? Film education, yeah, was actively involved in the educational field. Uh, I, I was hoping my ambition for the kind of work that I was writing was that it would filter down into schools that you would actually get classes in school in, in semiotics. Because thinking was, you know, at the level of representations, one, it's very difficult to uh, intervene at the level of production. I mean, for example, if I were, which I never could get a job at the BBC, even if I were to enter the BBC, I would be, there, there's a cartoon by Thelwell, this big furry cat, and its owner has put a pill in its food and it, uh, to give it the pill, and it takes the food, and then there's these wonderful drawings of its expression, as he suddenly realises that there's something in it, and it spits it out. And I think anybody who got into those um, establishment institutions would either change and become an establishment person, or they would spat out. So I thought, well, we can't do anything about the, these, these representations at the level of production, but we can do something about it at the level of reception. So if, if the entire populace can be educated to, to read critically, semiotically, the, um, you know, the connotations, um, the, you know, the ideological, patriarchal, etc. ideologies that yeah. are dignified, then, um, you know, this is, this is useful work. So that was, and I forget, why I started on that, but it was part of that sense of what you were working for. Yeah, the utopian aspiration and that language and imagery were political. That's right. And then in terms of your and Peter's filmmaking, uh, I wonder if that came to an end with that Thatcherism, really, with, with, with the withdrawal of subsidies for the kind of work that you were doing. That, that you couldn't afford to carry on doing it. And something, if, if maybe this is the time to segue into uh, the more recent, uh, in, in, in fact, the contemporary scene. And in, 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 in fact, in, I forget which of the essays it was in, Laura, but you said something about it, it reminded me of Benjamin about, you know, thinking about history doesn't mean reconstructing things as they were, it means grasping a moment as it, comes up in a moment of dying, you know, in a time of danger. And you know, that's something that reminded me of that about looking back, as we're doing now, at the 70s and the 80s, not yeah, simply yeah. as a trip, nostalgic trip down memory lane, but to interrogate what that might mean for us now, what, and what differences there are. And one of the things I think I did remark in that article that you just cited was that at the time you and Peter were working, even an alternative low budget film was way beyond the means of you know, the majority of people. And if you didn't get a subsidy for it, these were non-commercial, then you couldn't you know, carry on working. And I suspect that's probably what happened to you and Peter. Is that right? Yeah. Where, where, where today, and, and I, well, I, was, I was watching the news on television here last night and I had to think about Cannes uh, inevitably. Uh, and they've actually got a prize now for I iPhone movies, for, for Netflix movies, uh, made on an iPhone. No, not Netflix, TikTok. Yeah, yeah. There's a prize at Cannes for a film released on TikTok made on an iPhone. So that's, that's a radical yeah, difference. Yeah. But it's a radical difference that doesn't seem to have made any difference. And that's the other 
question, that there seems to be not the kind of political consciousness in relation to this kind of filmmaking that there was in your time yes. back then. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, I think, I mean, this was something that I actually wanted to come back to in your mutations uh, essay, because in a sense running through like a thread right the way through the mutations essay was the way in which the triumph of neoliberalism brought our utopian aspirations to an end. Uh, and in the film world, uh, I mean, the uh, um, these crazy theoretical films weren't really fundable anymore because they showed no value for money. On the other hand, Channel 4 started up and yes. it did offer a new home, but of a rather different kind, more for a new kind of art cinema than for the theoretical films of the kind that we'd been making, which, to tell the honest truth, belonged to the 70s and really couldn't really negotiate their way into the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, where the sense of crisis and disillusionment uh, I think was quite strong. But this might be, if we're talking about the 80s, this might be a moment to go on, Victor, because I said I wanted to ask you about, uh, to move us on to Diderot, Bart, Vertigo, and The Bridge, and talk about that as a turning point for you, mm -hmm. which was mid-neoliberal um, triumph, as it were. Yes. But yes. you're turning into a different direction. Mm -hmm. Well, the, that essay was actually written for a conference on film and photography at University of California, Santa Barbara, in 1984. Mm. And it was at that conference that Christine... 1984, met. I said. I meant 1984, not 1984. Yeah. No, I, I thought it said 84 anyway. Yeah. But, yeah, 84, 94, it's all collapsed into one now for me. But, um, yeah, Metz gave his paper on photography and fetishism at the same conference. And I made that piece, The Bridge, in the same year. So it's it's a kind of a different mise-en-scene of the same idea. I kind of wrote it out in uh, Diderot about Vertigo and made a kind of the gallery version of, uh, of the, you know, pretty much the same ideas. And But to come around to your, the connection I can make with your work there, uh, and thinking about the um, sequence from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes that um, that you wrote about, so part of my preparation for this was to was to look at it on YouTube just before I came here, and I was struck by how one could read that through through Diderot through the theory. I, cause I, I'm actually one of my interests, if not passions, is. Um, is the Baroque and you know Baroque opera, and in the Baroque there, there, there was a, a gestuelle, there was a there, there were highly coded there was there was a highly codified um, discipline of declamation. So if it was in the theatre, if it was Racine, or if it was in the opera with Lully or you know, Rameau, um, whoever was on the stage would produce this kind of complex of interlocking highly codified gestures which in, involve tone of voice, pitch, accentuation in the song, which involved facial expression, which involved gesture, the, the whole bodily posture. Yeah. And, I, 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 and I, I was struck when I was looking at the gentleman prefer Blondes again, of how one could read that through, through that and ask questions to what extent? Because what? Okay, what what happened is that as the Baroque degenerated into the um, you know the uh, rococo, like a garden going to seed, uh, all of that codification became elaborated, became decorative, and kind of fell apart really. And that's what Diderot was was writing against with the idea of the tableau. Um, he he wanted none of this seek um, mine, but he wanted. He said, a, a man with ordinary common sense, somebody <laughs> <laughs> to to be able to look at the stage yeah. and without hearing anything, yeah. know what was happening, knowing what the situation was, yeah. just the basis of the gestures. 
Yeah. Now we move on to 1953 into Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, certainly, the other thing that, that, that struck me, of course, is that the um, the tableau has its as I argue in that article has its origin in the 17th century notion of the peripatia, which was discussed in the first Art Academy, the first French Academy. The, academy, the Art Academies in those days were purely theoretical. Uh, it was assumed that you learned your drawing and painting skills in a studio with a master, but the Academy was there for theory. And, uh, how and, interesting. And, and that was one of the primary points of discussion, endlessly discussed. How does the painter, with only one image at her or his disposal, more often him than her in those days, but not exclusively, how do they convey the story? Well, it was assumed that you knew the story in advance, of course, but you chose that punctual moment when the story tips, it turns into something else. Uh, and th that was the tableau. You chose your tableau on the basis of that text. And I was struck watching the dance routine, which I went to watch as a dance routine, how it's a narrative. The song is actually a story. It's a rather scurrilous story of the two girls who receive gentlemen callers on the wrong side of the tracks. Perhaps, exactly. yeah. <laughs> One of them gets her heart broke, goes to New York, yeah. determined to wreak her revenge one yeah. day, and wreaks it, is able to put in a position of power in yeah. order to wreak it through carrying on the same kind of behavior she did on the wrong I'll side of the track. Right back and thank. But with wealthier men. And, yeah. and, and so it's, it's, a, it's a narrative, it has a narrative arc. Yes. Um, and that story is being told with, with gestures. You know, we're back with the 18th century stage, we're back with the 17th century stage. But one might raise those questions of uh, codification, where that codification came from, and you speak a little about this, and you know I agree with your interpretations on, of them. Um, but where does that come from? But you see, uh, Victor, I think there, there is a link uh, because of um, the way, I mean, we don't, shouldn't go into this too deeply, but just no. as it were, a very quick aside, uh, that there has been interest in the way that that analysis of uh, gesture and facial expression and um, uh, position and so on uh, in the theatre of the French theatre of the melodrama uh, then became um, fed in, in a sense, not necessarily directly, but by facing the same kinds of problems uh, into the silent cinema, mm. uh, which also had to be a cinema of gesture and facial expression and poised emotion. How do you express emotion uh, and so on? And it's been argued that that kind of moved into the Hollywood genre of uh, melodrama, women's weepies, etc., etc., mm. with the kind of sense of displacement of emotion into something else. Uh, but I think it's also there very dramatically. And I haven't thought about this really enough until you've just mentioned it now. Uh, in, in dance, in the Hollywood dance, and mm -hmm. how that brings so much together. Uh, but I suppose what I was interested in, and takes us back to a, another aspect of our discussion, is that I was interested in the way that Marilyn felt herself as, um, as a figure of stillness. Mm -hmm. And she found the way, she found the literary aspect of cinema, the way she was expected to learn her lines and so on, uh, more tiresome than actually posing and having a relationship with the camera. Mm. So, to go back to one of your wonderful concepts, between us, mm -hmm. uh, she was very much in between the still and the moving image. Uh, this isn't so much the case of her later life, uh, which we won't go into now, but I think at that point, she had that extraordinary ability to convey both, as it were. Yeah. Uh, both the stillness of cinema, which was before we moved into this other virtual world, was just a series of stills animated for us by the projector. Mm. And she kind of reminds us, certain 
uh, certain stars particularly remind us of that ability to still to be still in the cinema uh, and also at the same time that sense of the the figure posed which can also move and convey emotion etc so i think there's a real line of uh, descent there and it's really nice that you brought it back into the Marilyn piece yeah and, and it does raise that point that we were discussing previously um, on email that others were not privy to about <laughs> the relationship of the still uh, and uh, the still is the component of analog film that allows for movement and the role of temporality there and how Laura you have gravitated at different moments within your writing certainly in the in the King book and with uh, the gentleman prefer blondes piece that you were just discussing gravitating towards the still image and the stillness within cinema and with Victor's um, sequence image concept which is not necessarily a still, but kind of a moment, a, a punctum like the tableau, where you're 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 bringing time to a standstill. You're bringing movement to a standstill in order to engage with and play with the elasticity of cinema and its ability to um, to to work with time and memory and and what constitutes the contiguous. Yes. And if, um, oh goodness, I've forgotten what I, I had something so important I was going to say, to just add to what Ryan was just saying. Oh yes, I knew what it was. Um, when you were talking about the tableau, uh, Victor, you also, you were talking about that as in a sense, something that can be deciphered by the man of common sense. But also there's the way in which the punctum uh, re relates to individual fantasy. Yes individual desire and perhaps we could just move on to that for a moment Ryan would that fit in with what you were saying absolutely any way you want to go with that is fine I, I, I would just take a quick second here though to remind people if they want to ask questions we will be moving to a Q&A session although abbreviated uh, soon so you can put it in the chat and I will funnel a couple to them after we have this this last foray if that's all right with you too yeah, the, to reply to Laura, the, in the uh, Dieter Robert Vertigo article from 1984, uh, I go back to, um, obviously, to, uh, to Dieter Ho and to precursors in the French Academy, but via Bart and um, using Vidro Brecht Eisenstein, you know, my titles of Clandoye towards that. Um, and Bart uses a series of terms. He uses hieroglyph, he uses tableau, he speaks of Lessing's idea of the pregnant moment. And Bart collapses all those into one. He's, he's, he's speaking of the, uh, the, the gesture in Brecht, in Brecht's epic theatre. Yeah. And he, he, he brings this notion of the pregnant moment from Lessing. He also, met, he also uses the word hieroglyph and he also uses the word tableau, but he uses them all as um, alternative ways of talking about the same thing. And one of the things I've tried to do in my article is to tease them apart. So to answer Laura, the, um, the punctum in Bart's uh, Chambre Claire Chambre is um, really the hieroglyph in his uh, Diderot Bart Vertigo article. And the, the hieroglyph, again, as I speak about, I'll speak about it in that article. It goes back to, um, uh, to Renaissance uh, scholasticism, looking at the hieroglyph and deciding that the hieroglyph was a privileged means of access to meaning without the use of words. Yes. But exactly. one, one, one looks and one has the meaning. And, and of course, you find this in uh, early Christian doctrine. Those in, the state of, those in the state of grace can look at the world that God has created for us and know God's will because it's written, it's inscribed in the world, as it were, in a hieroglyphic form. Um, and and the, the, I think the punctum inherits that tradition unconsciously 
no, no doubt. But now what I do, of course, in that article is to interpret it from within the context of psychoanalytic theory yeah. and, and, and say what the way I used to put it to students is um, this is if we're all walking around the world with a number of buttons that can be pushed. You know, those those buttons are related to unconscious contents and those unconscious contents can be triggered by certain configurations in the outside world. Uh, and then it could be a word. So, you know, words can face like Janus, like the sign and Saussure's definition, onto the public world, but also onto the inner private world where it means something different. Or an image can push your button. So but my way of looking at the punctum was that what Bart's talking about is an image that's capable of pushing his button because it has the same hieroglyph, the matching hieroglyph inscribed on it, that's inscribed on his button, if that makes sense. Um, so that's that's the peripeteia, and it's quite different from tableau. Tableau is on the side, in in terms of the punctum distinction, it's on it's on the studium, it's yeah. on the side of the studium. Yeah. The tableau, as Diderot said, is on the side of what any man of common sense can understand, and that's that's precisely Bart's definition of the uh, of the studium as opposed to the punctum. So the tableau studium, that kind of everyone can understand it, common knowledge, we all agree. Nobody needs to explain it. Punctum, hieroglyphic, mysterious, somehow goes beyond what we can explain. And relates to fantasy, the unconscious. Absolutely, and, and, and can um, release uh, an affect. I realise that Ryan's beginning to feel we should be moving on, but mm. I'd just like to say that the way in which I find one of the fascinating things about Victor's thought is the way that so much of his interest in movement isn't so much, say, the movement of images, it's how you can wander, you can roam in the, or your own mind. Um, I know Victor's very interested in travel and in expo exploration of cities and that kind of mo movement, which is also one that triggers reflection, fantasy, um, into, um, um, unconscious experience and kind of triggers all kinds of thing, things of that kind. So I've been, in, sorry, I'm getting a little bit confused because I'm trying to hurry so much, but I really like the way in which these ideas of, uh, of movement uh, can be related to the movement of the mind mm -hmm. rather than of literal movement, right. and then when Victor is experiencing the literal movement of travel, he then relates it back to the to the movement of the mind, the fantasy, and the chance encounter, etc., etc. Something like that, Victor. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was distracted for for a moment by a local event. Um, but, yeah, sorry, again. No, but, but one thing, actually, maybe one thing I thought about was, okay, this is how it happened, association. Um, you were talking about travel and movement. My mind went to, I just came down here to the country, you're in the country, I came down here to the country from Paris on the train. And of course, a lot of people on the train watching films on their iPhones propped in front of them. Mm -hmm. reproducing what one used to get in, uh, still gets that, in air travel, where people are sitting watching the video on the seat back in front of them. Um, and I was thinking about how films are watched while traveling so often now. And again, one of the things that struck, what always used to strike me about films seen from a distance, for example, if you look out of the window in a city and in an apartment opposite, the television is on and you don't know what's happening, you can't see what's happening, you just see the edits. And similarly, I have the memory, we've all had it, of standing at the back of an aircraft looking down the aisle. Everyone's watching the same film before they had a choice. So all the edits happening at the same time and you just see the edits. Mm. What really strikes me now on the train coming down from Paris, people are watching different films, the edits are the same. You know, it's always the same. It's always the same thing. It's always the same thing. And the, you know, the exchange of glances. Everything yeah, is the yeah. same thing. But that 
in turn brought me to think we haven't touched on what we advertised we would touch on, which is new technology. Mm. So, okay. so it, it's, it's no longer new technology. Uh, are there any questions? Um, yeah, there, there is one, in fact, that, that speaks very directly to that. Um, it says, the uh, question goes, do you think the idea, feeling, sense of the punctum has changed the meaning uh, taken on further meaning via new technologies? What, what, what have various technological innovations meant to perhaps the way in which we understand the punctum? I don't think, that if, if I can jump on an answer, that, um, I, I don't think they make any difference to it whatsoever. Yeah. Because the punctum is, it's not a thing in the world. No. It's, um, like, it's, it's a predetermined choice made by an individual that uh, there is something in the world, a configuration in the world, and as I say, it could be a word, although Bart doesn't talk about this, but, so let's just talk about a detail in a photograph, which is what he talks about. The, um, the detail in the photograph that he calls the punctum is one, in my version of things, that has pressed your button. It's released an unconscious affect, which you're incapable of explaining. So um, that's, that's the difference from the um, studio. I mean, you know, if you see a picture of a child in distress and you're moved, anybody would be. If you see a picture of a spoon on a table and you're moved, something funny is happening. You know, it's something to do with something in your past. So so-called new technology, which of course is no longer new, digital technology makes no difference whatsoever to this. It does, in a sense, to me, in from my point of view, because um, I, I was very struck uh, when I was working towards um, death 24 times a second, mm -hmm. reading the wonderful Roland Barthes and reading uh, Camera Lucida and dwelling on the moment when he says, film domesticates the photograph. You can't you cannot find the punctum because it moves too fast <laughs> and the punctum is concealed by narrative. Hmm. And so what I felt when I started experimenting with the help of, well, I mean, earlier with VHS, but it wasn't so much fun. When I started experimenting with slowing down films and stopping them, delaying the cinema, as I called it, I thought, what a terrible shame that Roland died before he could actually do this experiment and discover that there is a punctum. <laughs> and so, in a way, my Marilyn experience was one, for me, of discovering a moment of punctum. So I couldn't understand why I went back to the sequence over and over again. And sometimes I thought it was because of her strange gesture, which goes back exactly to gesture, uh, uh, Victor. When she pulls up her shoulder strap as though her bra was falling off the edge of her shoulder. And it's a gesture of a kind of slight sluttishness, yes. which she does with such extraordinary elegance. Mm. That, that to me, I think, was a kind of punctum. But, see, so, uh, no, sorry. Go on, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. You wouldn't have felt it because the whole thing would have slid, slid on with the beautiful music and the song and Jane Russell, etc. What were you going to say? I, th I, I would relate that rather to Bart's discussion of Brecht and the gesture. Yeah, yeah. And, and Eisenstein. Yeah, uh, precisely. And, uh, his, his work there is completely around stills. Yeah. And, and so, those books that used to have stills from all of the, from the films, right? Yeah. And, and that gesture that Marilyn makes, I, I think that if Diderot were here, he would approve of it on the basis that any man of common yes, sense understand can it. understand yes. it. Yes. A sweet disorder in the dress, as Herrick said. Yes. <laughs> but, well, um, so, but so, so I, I, would not that, I would not call that a punctum. I would call that a studio. Studio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then um, I still think, even if it doesn't work for Marilyn, I still think I find punk, punk, tea? Punk tie, yes. <laughs> in, uh, in, in the moving image. 
um, when I stop and find a moment which I find moving in an uh, irrational way. And why would you not? Why would you not? Um, yes. This, I think, is enabled by, uh, by the ability to delay and hold and pause and return. And the sequence image that that Victor has um, is another version of that. Actually, before we were able to stop it and pause it or or find a particular still, it's us creating our own still from the material experience of the temporal flow of the film. Is mm. that, is yes, that right? and that's where the remembered film emerges. Yes, yes, uh, and that's where the fragment that stays in the memory after the screening that Victor writes about. And, and, and the punctum could be brought to that, punctum studio yeah. could be brought to that, yeah. via the psychoanalytic question, why this image and not some other? And that's another one. Yeah, you know, it's like, um, you know, somebody makes a slip of the tongue and somebody jumps on us and says, ah, you know, that's all the unconscious of work. And they say, no, don't be ridiculous, I was tired. <laughs> and it says, yeah, of course, you were t of course you were tired, and that's why you made the slip of the tongue. Exactly. Why that slip? Why that slip? And that's yeah. some other. So the remembered film, I remember this. Why this and not some other? Now, sometimes the, 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 the this I remember can be put on the side of the uh, studium, because any common sense would probably remember this. You know, the famous Marilyn dress sequence from... Uh, you know the one, the uh, the subway wind. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, seven year itch. Seven year itch. Yes. Seven year itch. Yeah, but everyone remembers that. But there are other things I remember which I don't think anybody else would would remember. So that's on the side of the point, and that's my personal button being pushed. Yeah, I I realize we're about to run out of time, so I'm going to squeeze in one more question, if if you will indulge it. And this one is asking, is there space for a utopic feminist cinema in Hollywood today? Laura. Yeah, I think that was directed at Laura. In... <coughs> um, <coughs> I'm not sure that the film industry, I mean, I'm actually not really up to date with Hollywood. Right. I haven't really been following it, and I just don't really know if I can answer that question. Sure. I, I do think that there's... Uh, 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 I'm not sure that an, a film industry can actually accommodate that level of utopianism. Um, I think there's... Uh, it, it flourishes on the margins rather than uh, where money flourishes. Right. It, it loses out to the neoliberal um, demand to monetize. Then I, don't want to be, then I don't want to end on a depressing note either. <laughs> One should always hope. Hope is always there, yes. All right, well, um, I think on that wonderful note, I will go ahead and uh, draw this to a close by thanking you both, Victor as simultaneous guest and host, and Laura as guest but um, engaged interlocutor and questioner of Victor. It's been a really wonderful session. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts and your work over all the years. Well, thank you, Ryan, for bringing us together. Yes, thank you. It was great. Yeah. It was great. Well, it's my pleasure, and I, I hope we can maybe do this again another time. <laughs> well, we didn't really cover our agenda. No, we didn't. There's there's a lot left to be said. Mm. We'll get you down to WSA, Laura, and we'll do this in person. Right. Look forward to it. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks uh, to everyone who attended online. And thank you to uh, Claire Wilkins and Anushka for your support behind the scenes, and Adrian for the technical support, where he's going to clean this all up for broadcast later. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.